So good morning, everyone, and thank you to the organizers for giving me the chance to be a little bit provocative. <laughs> and uh, I just have to remember how to change. There we go. So I, this is something that's been building up inside me and I wanted to talk about. And uh, uh, as you'll see, uh, I've got a few different ideas and I'm talking, if you like, to the next generation, thinking to themselves, how can I really make a mark? And um, so we'll talk about impact, about the need for thinking about behavior, and then come on perhaps to some issues that if you follow the behavior and the decision making uh, that are thrown up in our world. And uh, if you go to food quality and preference and you start looking at the most downloaded food quality and preference articles, if you're a sensometrician, it's a little bit depressing because you don't see so many. I have some hopes of some coming along. And uh, in fact, when I looked, the nearest I could get was not really a sensometrics, but at least it was methodology. And yet, I believe that in consumer science, and I'm not saying in sensometrics, but in consumer science, I think we're often measuring the wrong var variables. I'll give an example where I think we're using the wrong tests to do it. And I believe, as sensometricians, we may be promoting the wrong models. And so I think there's a big opportunity here for sensometricians to show some leadership. Get hold of this and go to the top of the impact scoreboard. And here we are with uh, Harry Lawless, Sensory science, the traditional view. This is the view that I've perhaps been working in most of my uh, life. We see sensory uh, breaking down into discrimination tests and expert panels. And consumers are over there and they're doing a bit of effective testing and we may be doing central location or home use. And uh, you have to ask yourself, is that really what we uh, should be doing in the 21st century? How have things changed? And my belief is that, you know, uh, and it's clear from some of the work that's coming, is we really have to say, let's get to grips with consumer behavior and see if this current traditional view still holds and is still relevant. And so therefore, my proposition to you is that we must use our statistical theory and tools to explain and model consumer behavior rather than maximizing power. And I'll give you an example of where I think we've been in danger of that. And let me first of all acknowledge the great work of John Ennis and his colleagues for excellent research and uh, giving us added understanding with their uh, Thurstonian approaches. And uh, they, in particular, have targeted the triangle <coughs> test, which is a great workhorse of, uh, of, of us in sensory science. And we all know that it's used throughout the food, beverage, and personal products industry to see if people can notice a difference. Pick the odd one out. And they said, you know, if you add one sample and you go from three samples to four, and you say, not pick out one pair, but pick out two pairs. You know the power of that test goes up. And here's their power in a situation where the signal to noise, the difference to the noise is 1.5. And they said, you know, by our calculations, you can replace a triangle test with 60 people if you want a power of 0.8. By only 15. Well, that's a big saving. And a big company in USA has adopted Tetrad instead of Triangle. And if they made the point and they said, if you go to a noisy situation where actually the signal is about the same as the noise, in fact, Triangle will never get to a point eight. 
So you're stuck with Tetrad if you want to do that. So what could I possibly argue with that? Well, I want to introduce you to someone which I thought I'd call Pascal for some reason. Uh, and uh, this, this fellow is uh, just thinking to himself, I just ate three Snickers bars and the middle one was different to the other two. What am I going to do? Did, when did I last do that, by the way? When did I last do that? <laughs> Uh, or I, I just ate four Snickers bars and I can clearly put them into two pairs. When, when did I last do that? When did anyone do that? They never did. What about this one? That Snickers bar didn't taste like it usually does. I think Pascal does that quite regularly. Okay, he tastes it, and he thinks, and he says, it's not actually what I usually do. So, what about a test for that? Well, there is one there. The A, not A test. You say to a consumer, is this product Snickers or not? Why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we measuring that behavior? Because it's not as accurate as triangle, is it? It's not as powerful. But it's actually the behavior that we're trying to look at. So I think there's a problem here. And in actual fact, you can think, and they've looked at it, something called reminder A, not A, where I just ate a Snickers bar and I may eat another one. And the question is, would I notice that then? And that kind of behavior is right. We can sometimes consume the product and notice the difference, or we consume the product repeatedly and then notice the difference after that, or we consume the product repeatedly and then change our buying behavior, sometimes without even any conscious recognition of why we've done that. Those are the things I'd like to look at. Because we're actually measuring the right behavior, we can think about the reminder A, not A, as looking at that. And as a, we've actually successfully applied that approach to a commercial shelf life study. And the people were very pleased with it because they said, you know, it, it actually measures what's going on in the real world. And in actual fact, before you say it's not very powerful, in fact, her song Lee in Korea and her colleagues have shown that actually reminder A, not A, is actually quite a powerful test. In, on the basis of the same number of samples, you can see here that it's 1.49 times better than the triangle, where in fact the tetrad is actually, under their conditions, not as good. And I'm not going to get into the, the detail there. What I'm going to say is, it's measuring behavior. It's a better test. And so, therefore, in sensor metrics, we should bear that in mind. And uh, we can think about, you know, a, a bar during a session where we're doing a drink, and then we get a slightly reformulated drink presented straight after. We can start to talk about that particular measure. What about in the real world again? And we were told a story uh, uh, many years ago by a guy from Mars who probably shouldn't have told it, but he did anyway. And it was about Snickers. And it was about the old salami slice story where you take a little bit of chocolate off and you do a triangle test. You take it out and there's no difference. So you say, well, let's take a little bit more off. We'll take some more off and we'll put it out again. And nothing happened for six months. And then the sales start to drop. So the truth is it took six months for the people to actually kind of respond to that. And tell me how that process works, because I don't know. And it seems strange to me that in the 21st century that I don't know how that works. And it seems to me we should think about how it works. And what we need is clearly repeated assessment trials, because eating and drinking, food and beverage products 
One of the consistent things is we do it a lot. Okay, and so the changes are incremental, but they're real. There's relatively little work on this, but the health guys did look at a lot of this. And here is a nice example where if you make a conscious change, and these respondents by uh, Rick Matters were asked to switch to a low-fat diet. And they weren't allowed, by the way, to go for the modified fat products. So they actually had to switch to a low-fat diet to go through that experience. And when they did that, their hedonic liking for full-fat foods dropped across a 12-week period, and it was maintained for a further 12-week following. So this is an updating process between liking and expectation. Not just difference, but liking. Again, I don't know how that works, but I'm interested to know how it works, and I believe I can only do it by repeated assessment trials. Costa, at Costa, one of the great figures, thinking figures in our field, of course, has thought about this. And this is a chapter, a, a figure from uh, uh, something he did for my book. And the one I want you to uh, look at there, it, it's, it's, uh, what he does is, he does a CLT test over there. Whoops, I knew that was going to happen. And you can see product A is liked better than the other two. He then breaks one group, well, breaks them all into three groups and makes them taste them over an intensive period of time. And something happens to A, something changes. He proposes that people actually don't understand the product, to, first of all, at the sip. He thinks that actually it takes them all those tastes before they really figure it out. I have a different theory, but it's worth looking at. What you can see here is, is that they don't like A after that. And in fact, the other two groups that have been tasting also don't like A. And he says, you know, so the people that go home after the SIP test are making a wrong decision, but they finish their trial, they can have a nice drink at the end of the day. But in actual fact, if we look at repeated testing, we will get a different story. And maybe, he says, we'll stop products being passed by SIP test and failing after two months. So where have I got to? 15 minutes. Uh, we should select the test that measures behavior above power. Repeated assessments on products will give us insight into decision making after reformulation. Here's Pascal again, and let me just have a swipe at a few other techniques, a few other measures. Complete the sentence. I have freely sorted eight products into three groups, and now I'm going to... What? I can't think. What about, I've laid these eight products out on a tablecloth, and now I'm going to, I can't think. I know why we're doing these things, but I'm just not sure that it's coming at it from a behavioral basis. Here's one that I absolutely think is the worst, the best, worst. So I've looked at these lists, and by the way, I've had 16 of them, these lists of five, and I've told you what I think is the best and worst. It's an excruciating thing to do, and I'm really not sure what it actually uh, has to do with behavior. Now, these are cheap shots, okay? I understand that. Uh, I'm just making a point. But let's come on to one that I've, uh, I've been thinking about. I score this product a seven out of nine on a liking scale, and now I will go and buy it. Go and eat it, enjoy it. What are the things I'm going to do? Well, Costa again says we must acknowledge, first of all, diversity of response. Just because we score seven on the nine-point scale, it doesn't mean everybody scores seven on the nine-point scale, and so we need to think about that. And Evelyn, 
has done, who uh, may or may not be here, but she's done some good work in this area and she got me going on it and I start now routinely when I do my clustering. I take the cluster mean and I correlate it with all the members and I look at it and it's very depressing. And uh, Vigno and others, I've seen it in practice, they say, you know, we can't fit these people. We'll chuck them all in a rubbish, uh, irrelevant uh, uh, group. They just don't fit our world, and we can carry on. Uh, they've gone. And uh, I don't know, there's something I find a bit uncomfortable about that. Because typically this noise cluster can have 20 to 30% of respondents. So a third of the people we're dealing with don't even fit in our model. That's a bit of a problem, isn't it? Now, I know what you'll say is those are people that don't use sensory. Okay? They're influenced by other things. Well, that may be true. Uh, show me the work. Because I don't think I've seen that work. I don't think I've really looked at those non-footed fitting people. And by the way, will they do that again if I make them do it again? Or will they fit into that new cluster if I give them seven exposures? Because they're going to get seven exposures, aren't they? So, you know, somehow I'm not comfortable with that, and I think we should look at it. So, if you're going to think about behaviour, what I start to do is say, well, the psychologists must understand all this. Why don't we go and look at what they say? Because, you know, we don't need to invent the wheel here, do we? And so let's go and look at some psychological models. And the first one that you come up with in the 21st century is dual processing. The idea that humans seem to have more than one mind. In England, we say, I'm in two minds. And uh, many people have put forward, and uh, it seems to be now that we think of two general versions of this. We think of the uh, fast, effortless, non-conscious, uh, automatic kind of decision-making, which we all do so much of. And then there's the thoughtful, slow. Pascal thinking here about his... Uh, healthiness, etc., versus that automatic, intuitive choices that we very often make. The fact is, we do both of these things, and we should recognize that. And we do both of those things eating the same thing, and we should recognize that. And a certain inconsistency in what we do is part of human behavior, and we should recognize that. He also noted, Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winner, let's not argue with that. He called them intuition and reasoning. And he said, you know that the intuition, the system one, is strongly emo uh, 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 emotional bonds are included in that reasoning process. But, he said, before you rush off and think that you've got to do all of that measure, it's difficult to change that one. It's much easier to get hold of system two and argue with it and persuade it and you will get some behavioral change. Plus, system two is in charge. When system one can't handle what's going on, it calls in the thinking. So system two is important. And we saw it, and I'll just tell this briefly. I'm still going okay. We saw... Uh, this many years ago, and some of you will have heard this story when we were looking. In fact, Nestle was part of the sponsor of that work, a chocolate mousse. And we did a trial in which, with the clear circles here, we simply asked people how much they liked the product. They didn't have to think very hard. They just had to say instinctively how much they liked the product. And then, later on, we gave them another test with the same products, and we made them do jars. And my belief is that to do a just about right score, you've got to think. Okay? And so, with the perhaps the non thinking, we got a product which we would say 
to the people 100% milk chocolate, no dark, and nine grams of sweetness. Pretty much maybe in the UK what the childhood, the instinctive response might have been at that time. But when we made people think about the ideal point, ooh, then we get 25% milk, 75% dark, and no grams of sugar. That was in 97. Probably the right product to make at that time was the sweet one. But remember, system two dominates. Where's the market gone since then? Well, you go and look on our shelves and you'll find an awful lot of dark, pretty dry sugar, uh, pretty uh, low sugar chocolate bars. So the conscious is important. Knowing the answer to both those questions is also very important. And, uh, you know, uh, we have, it is true, we want to know the automatic. And if we have elaborate and long questionnaires, we probably are not going to get automatic. I believe that a respondent's going to use both system one and system two in different contexts or even from one tasting to another. And we should understand that. And maybe some of those irrelevant consumers that didn't fit our model are doing that. There is a need for repeated assessment trials. Costa, of course, in his brilliant uh, uh, paper, much quoted, Diversity in the Determinants of Food Choice, has pointed all this out. He doesn't really go with system one, system two. I've talked to him about that. But he says, look, if you make people think, even if you ask the question, system two will go on to alert. And so he's pleaded for us all. And I can see it in the, in the companies I visit in America. I can see them gearing up with behavioral labs, with different equipment to be able to respond without asking. And I'm obviously in favor of that. But don't forget to ask the question. Don't forget actually what the uh, thinking mind would do because that's the mind you can change that's the mind that you can argue with you can't argue with system one very well he's pretty well pre-programmed for you and here's another one called heuristics and again Kahneman and other people have gone for this and uh, heuristics are strategies we all use to deal with problems. And here he gives an example of uh, when you ask someone a difficult question, they answer an easier one instead. So, what proportion of long distance relationships break up within a year? You may answer as if you've been asked, do any instances of failed long distance relationships come readily to mind? Or, how likely is it that this candidate could be tenured in our department, may answer the much easier question, how impressive was the tool? Now, again, this is going to be a cheap shot, but what about a consumer science heuristic? Many years ago, we were faced with a question, how does repeated <coughs> consumer experience of consuming or using a new or modified product influence repurchase? And what we chose to do, and I was there, what we chose to do was say, how does the sensory experience of 10 or 12 people influence declared liking after one tasting or use by consumers? And I believe we've spent a lot of our time answering that question instead of the one at the top. And that's a bit of an issue. And that we should set that right. Well, you say, just a minute, though, like in predicts behavior. If people like something, they're going to buy it. Okay, well, let's go and test that. Mike Amani's had a look at that. He got some people to eat some strawberry-flavored yogurts, and he then monitored them for a year to determine whether their ratings had any predictive. And what he found was that the highest-rated yogurts tended to be purchased. But if you thought there was a relationship between the rank rating and purchase frequency, using a regression, 
It wasn't there. Tormod Nace had a look at this. Cured ham, they rated their probability of buying, but then they were given the opportunity to take away. And for ranking and rating, if you took it away, then it was very likely to have been rated as either the best or the next best. There wasn't really a nice regression relationship. So maybe we don't need a complex quadratic model linking liking to sensory. Maybe we just need to pick a winner. And there's a technique from uh, Paris called Hedonext, which approaches that. And I like it. So they take 250 women, they assess the products monadically at home, and give a global hedonic score just as ordinary. But there's another 60 women. After each product they've tested, they say, if you like that one, if you're satisfied enough with it, we'll give you a month's supply, and you're out of the test. That's a real decision. That's not scoring liking. That's just a minute. I'm leaving the test, and I'll take that. Thank you very much. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? And the results on the left, now I know you can cluster this, but on the left, this is what we find so often, isn't it? Average liking, a flat <coughs> picture with no discrimination. They're scoring liking. On the right, they've made some choices. Hang on, we've got a winner here. And in fact, the other two winners are part of the clusters that are there. I like the idea of that. Now, marketing people aren't committed to liking. Marketing people are committed to that problem I've talk talked about, which is behavior. And one of the things we're seeing is marketing people saying, you know, we're just not interested in mean liking. Don't even bother to give it to us because it doesn't tell us anything. All we're interested in is top two box because if we look at Mike Amani, if we look at our own stuff, it's the pick a winner. Those are the ones that are going to get purchased. So just give us top two. And so we say, okay, we'll do the anivers for the product developers. And yeah, we get a nice set of discrimination. And we do our top three box. And we do a K proportions test and we get no significance. So we say, look, the best way to do it is look at the average liking because you get the significant difference. And the marketing people say, you know, these guys are just so way out of it. So what we're going to do is we will select the top three box. So we'll select A and B. Whereas the product developer has gone away working on G because that was the most liked. So we'd better have a look at this and figure out what's going on, haven't we? And it's going to change things when we go towards behavior. And here, I could call this if I wanted the end of PLS, okay? But I'm only kidding. But this is a slide from the heuristics guys. And he says, you know, what uh, economists and uh, statisticians think is that you can have this incredibly complicated regression model <coughs> such that we make infinitesimal changes in sensory and this causes liking to change and sales go up. Purchases go up. And he said, they say that's not how it is. People have a whole set of discontinuous simple ideas that they use to get through life. And you're not going to sort it out with a PLS model. You've got to come back and you've got to look at decisions. Like one reason decision making. People only, they don't <laughs> get to do much. They will just look at one thing and make their mind up. Or they go for take the best. If that's the case, then we should be thinking about that. And so here we are. We have preference mapping we're still comfortable with. We know how to do versus take the best. And we ought to move over and have a look and see what's going on. So there's a little bit of where I've got to. Okay, let's uh, ask you a question. I'm okay. 
Which US city has more inhabitants, San Diego or San Antonio? Think about that. Let me tell you that the Americans only get that correct 62% of the time, where the Germans get it right 100% of the time. Now, that's strange, isn't it? Why should that be? Well, the heuristics people say it's because the Germans actually haven't heard of San Antonio. They've only really heard of San Diego. <laughs> and this is the recognition heuristic when deciding which of two objects is greater on some criterion. If one object is recognized and the other is not, then we infer that the recognized object has the higher value, whatever that is. Whatever that is. Population, eating quality, you know, nutritional value. And so, of course, the brands are there. It's very disappointing when that's such a crucial heuristic that we do so few trials on these blind products. Maybe, again, those irrelevant consumers, maybe they're the ones that use the recognition heuristic. I don't know. Sensory researchers are starting to use these models without our assistance. So de Graaff is looking at sensory. He's looking at package. He's uh, putting it through uh, an emotional block and, and measuring food choice to see what goes on. And he, he shows some rather strange models at the end where he can actually say, you know, if people, uh, uh, if they come to rank one, then I can get 40% of uh, people modeled. It doesn't seem a very good model to me that you can only explain 40%. And I know that we need better models. Now, my final one is Charles Spence, a brilliant psychological uh, uh, professor at the University of Oxford. I've looked at his uh, 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 publication record, and he publishes in the absolute top quality sensory perception uh, uh, places And I said to him, come on, Charles, I want you to tell me the basis of sensory perception here. And he said, well, if you really press me, he said, it's attention. Whether you are paying attention to the signals that are going past you or not. <coughs> and he kind of gave me this, but I made it up myself. Let's take a couple of examples here. We've got two coffees. And if we pay attention, if we pay attention, we can see the difference between those coffees. But in the real world, and Kahneman says, if you're in a good mood or you're busy, then you have a pretty broad expectation space that you can work in. And you won't see any difference. You're not going to remark on those things at all. I find this a slightly more, uh, shall I say, uh, easier to swallow theory than the Ennis wandering ideal point, which strikes me as a, a, a bit wild, but I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise. And if you're not in a good mood, or you are paying attention, yes, you will see the difference. Yes, you will give a different score. And we know that our attention may well vary through doing a CLT, through doing other things. So there are very good models out there to explain what's going on if we actually listen to them. And so here's Pascal now beginning to worry about why he actually selected that brand of coffee again. And we want to try and explain that. And I don't know the models. All I'm listing is some of the things I believe we need to build into those models. And I hope some of you will do it. I'm intending to... Uh, give up my teaching for a year and have a go at some of them anyway, but it's a massive thing. What I do believe is that repeated measurement will be at the heart of that experimental, to understand what's going on. And that natural behavior, as far as possible, will be something. And that we should think about these um, different psychographic variables and... Uh, 
And so then we will end up trying to answer this question, which is at the heart of it. Not the one that I think we've been trying to answer with a 30% bundle of irrelevant consumers at the end of it. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice talk. I think that there is a lot to be frustrated today. And I think that there is a lot of questions maybe interrogations. Well, we do have an opportunity later on at the round table as well. <laughs> <laughs> so you have time for questions, please. As a psychologist by training, I like your dual process model. Could you talk a little bit about the measurement of implicit measures and any thoughts you have on that? Because they're notoriously hard to measure. That's right. Uh, but. Uh, that's the experimental psychologist's uh, solution, isn't it, to, uh, to look at that. And it is very effective, as is, um, you know, uh, some of the other measures. And uh, I, I've tried to understand the implicit uh, action, and they're difficult to set up. But we've seen them used in, in our area, and uh, Charles and Bettina, I think, have used uh, the implicit uh, test. So, I mean, I believe they are a very important part of measuring unconscious processing. And as I say, I believe that we uh, are going to have a lot of important information coming in. What I'm worried, if you like, is that the big race to go for the unconscious measurement, we're going to forget the conscious bit as well, and that we should bear in that in mind. And, you know, there's a... A story that somebody tells, I think it was, uh, uh, I haven't got time to go through it, but the, 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 the bottom line was, if you wanted, there's lots of different models of behavior, but at the end of the day, the psychologist said, I'll go down and ask them what they're doing. And we can't not do that. And, and I think we've been guilty of asking people too much and thinking that that was going to explain behavior. It's not. But if we go to unconscious, it's also not going to explain it. <coughs> but that's an important tool in our, uh, in our army. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Uh, in animals uh, studies, they are able to, to decipher liking versus wanting measurements. Uh, so the motivation to have a uh, stimulation. Uh, do you think we could uh, put that in place for humans? I do. Uh, and, um, and by the way, um, that business of desire, uh, the liking and desire, which was uh, put forward by the Bristol group, has never really been taken up. It's gone into emotions. And my comment on emotions is that you see, and you could see in the, uh, in the de Graaff paper, they get 50-odd emotions, but they do a PCA on them, and it's 90% liking and 10% arousal. And they didn't need to have all those words to do that. You know, I think what you're measuring with animals is affect and arousal, and that's probably all we need to do. I think we've taken a kind of our sensory kind of, we must go out and get all the words we can, measure them all and do it. Whereas I think psychologists would come in and say, well, why are you doing that when, when it all comes down to two dimensions and you can measure those things quite easily? I am being provocative, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> A last one? There's one it's from okay. Tom. Yeah. yeah. Oh, OK, sorry. Hal, thanks for the provocative talk. I just wanted to ask you, um, often product developers, they're looking for guidance in terms of how to reformulate a product. Um, and so that's why the sensory information is there. Um, coming back to them and just saying this product won or you know, more people are picking this one. How do you see the link between uh, the consumer choice and the perception of the product? Well, I think it's going to be pick the best. And that what it's not going to be good enough to say to people, um, you know, you're, doing, you're coming forth in the model. Uh, and thinking that that's okay. 
because it's not okay. Right, but I'm thinking specifically on the sensory aspect of it. Yeah, the model still stands. And, and unfortunately, in many companies, and everybody knows this, in ev every, many companies, we are not able to go on to the sales. We're not able to go on and do those tests with brands because marketing say that's our business. And you just stay doing your blind stuff. And they have, uh, you know, quite a bit of uh, scorn for it. But, of course, it's helpful to know how to move liking around it and not getting rid of that. But the next frontier is to be able to go out and start to understand this other stuff. Because I would argue, you know, we know how to do preference mapping. We, you know, the, we can do it. I'm not sure we need to spend more money on that. I think we need to, to go on to the, to the bit we don't understand. 